Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and today we are episode 90 of the show. That's right, 90 episodes, and we are going to be talking about uh, elections as always, but we're specifically going to be talking about Western representation in our democracy, and we're going to be talking with the, I, I can't say new, because this is November and he got appointed, if I'm not mistaken, in the beginning of October, that the, right. the executive director for the Maverick Party, end of end of party name, right? Just Maverick Party. That's it. Maverick Party Executive Director Matt Magdalene. Matt, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on. And episode ninety is a good good round number to be on. I think so. That's a big accomplishment as well. <laughs> there you go, Matt. Let's start off with the same question I've uh, asked all the candidates or uh, party officials who have come on for this series: is who is the Maverick Party? Who are the Maverick Party? Look, we're, um, the Maverick, it, like the, it, it's passionate people. It's people that, um, think that significant and fundamental change need to happen in Western Canada and federal politics. It needs to happen on every level, provincially and municipally as well in a lot of cases, but, but we're focusing on the federal level and, um, the West is underrepresented in Ottawa and, and that needs to change. And so the people that are frustrated with their options in terms of getting representation out west, those people are coming to Maverick and Flocks um, looking for representation. Now, you're relatively new to the party as well. You were the candidate in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, for Calgary. Midnapur. Midnapur. And so everybody's new to the party. We've we've just just got past our one-year anniversary of the party, right? So there's no, there's no uh, with the exception of maybe the party leader, there's no veterans around. Um, we are all new to it. The party's really new. And, um, and the, the response, we've, I think we've accomplished a lot in a very short period of time in terms of organizing and, and getting people together with a common goal. Well, and let, we'll, we'll talk about that for a brief moment here for a second, because you formed the party, if I'm not mistaken, last, almost last fall, almost a year ago to like this month or a few months uh, either way. And you were thrown into a party, uh, an election. You were able to get 32 plus candidates for that campaign. Um, were you happy with how everything turned out in that campaign? Because you were a new party, upstart party, who came out of nowhere to try and bring true representation to Western Canada. And here you are. So, yes, the short answer is, is <laughs> I'm really happy. Um, and, and I'll explain why. I mean, out West, I, I would argue, I'd make the argument that Western Canada is the heart of new parties forming. Um, if you look historically, I mean, on a provincial level in Alberta, where we are today, um, it's party after party after party that, that forms here. It's sort of in the culture. If, if you don't have what you want, you form your own party and, and you bring to the table what you're looking for. And um, if you look at how these parties form and then fail most of the time, um, it's because they mess it up right out of the gate, right? And so our, our goal uh, through this rushed first election, because we didn't have a lot of time to prepare for it, our goal was to get through a campaign um, without doing anything stupid, if I could say that. Um, and I think we succeeded at that. We, we had amazing candidates um, who, who were maybe the best candidate group out of any party, I would argue. Um, everybody had uh, a ton of valuable experience to bring to the table in different fields. Um, and I think everybody represented the party really well and everybody looking at it now at least can see that we're not a bunch of wahoos, uh, not a bunch of Western rednecks just, just trying to, to break the country apart. We are a legitimate party that has a legitimate future and a, limit, a legitimate place in Canada. So sticking on the election, um, I, when I when I talk with representatives and candidates, past candidates, I, I ask this question, and I, I hope you are willing to answer it. And I think you are because you seem like a good guy. But where did the party go wrong? Because you didn't make the inroads that you wanted to. Because you, I'm assuming you would rather have a few people in parliament right now, but it didn't happen. So where did the party go wrong? And was it just that time frame that you talked about that because it was short turnaround that people didn't get to know you? You weren't able to make that inroads or what was it from your perspective? I mean, I, I've spent the last uh, couple of weeks asking this question um, and I've, I've, I've spoken at length with with uh, just about all of the candidates that ran in the election. I've spoken at length with various uh, EDAs or electoral district associations and their groups. 
And so the answer to that question is, you know, you'll get as many answers as, as the people you ask. Um, but, but there is one common theme to the feedback that I've been getting from the election and that regardless of, of, of you set everything else aside, there is a space in the political spectrum right now for regional representation in federal politics. And everybody agrees on that. Uh, and so I think um, we didn't have enough time. That's what it boils down to. We did not have enough time to let Westerners know that we are here and we are an option. And so now we go into another election cycle, I guess. You had mentioned it's an endless election cycle now with minority governments going forward. Uh, and I think that's going to be a pattern that we see a lot more of in the future in Canada. So we have a chance between now and the next election to become a, a, a staple of the West, to become the voice for the West, to advocate for um, for Westerners, um, to advocate for the things that we need to get a fair deal in Confederation. We just didn't have enough time to get our name out there uh, before the, the election that we just had. One of the things that I heard when I spoke to Canadians, and not only here in Alberta, but I have family members in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and a few in BC, but when I spoke to uh, uh, Canadians in the Western provinces and even the territories was, I wish there was a candidate in my riding. Because you only ran the 32 candidates. You didn't run in the whole 107, 108, or however many ridings are west of Manitoba. But is that the plan? Because I know interim leader Jay Hill has said that that's the plan for next election. Full slate of candidates, no matter what, we're going to run them. Is that the plan as the new executive director is to identify candidates starting today to lead up to that election? Look, we'd, lo we'd love to run a full slate. and The plan is a full slate for the next election. Um, the approach that, that the party has taken from day one is that in order for this to be effective, it has to be, I know the term gets used too much, but it has to be a grassroots movement. And a grassroots movement means giving autonomy to your electoral district associations and letting the local community pick their candidate. And so step one is forming EDAs. And step two is allowing those EDAs the freedom and the autonomy to, to pick the person that they would like to represent them in Ottawa. The whole, the whole message of Maverick is that your MP in Ottawa should be representing you and not caving to the party leader. And the first step in that is to give the local community, the people that are going to be represented, the choice of who goes out to Ottawa to do it. And so we were not ever, uh, we didn't have any intention of parachuting candidates into ridings like other parties. Um, you know, it, it's really easy to, to, you know, pick a dozen people and, and tell them you're going to run here, you're going to run here, you're going to run here. But at the end of the day, those people have no connection to their local community. And, and when that happens, they, they, they have no incentive to represent their local community. So you need, you know, it's, it's a process, but the goal, and I think it's an achievable goal is to run a full slate depending on how much time Trudeau gives us this time before he calls another election. Well, so we'll see. During the last election, he said 18 months. So 2024, <laughs> here we come. I can't wait for that. Um, I, I want to talk about EDAs for a second because your role as the, uh, the new executive director of the Maverick Party is to help set those up. That's a lot of time away from potentially you running in the future as well if you decide to run again. Is, are you up for the challenge to go crisscrossing across this country while I know COVID-19 is still here and travel restrictions are still potentially in place if you have to go to Manitoba or Saskatchewan? Are you up for the challenge of meeting Canadians through Western Canada to talk about this? Because it's going to be a tough challenge because we have no representation for the Maverick Party in Parliament. So... Canadians might say, well, how do, how do we ensure that if we put our trust in you, you're going to well, I mean, advocate for our true... I, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm up for the challenge, but, but we, you know, first off, technology is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Zoom sends you across the country really quickly. But, but we need more than that. We do need to be around locally. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be doing quite a bit of traveling, I'm sure, over the next two years. Um, but more importantly... That face, I hope that face isn't me. Um, I hope that um, we have an effective leadership race um, shortly. And um, Jay Hill has been a wonderful start to this party, and, and we're grateful for his experience. Um, and I hope he stays with us in some capacity. But the, the next leader of the party, um, that's what we're focused on. And so when that happens um, and the party members elect a new leader, um, 
that poor individual is going to have a lot of traveling to do. Uh, I'll be honest, more so than me, right? Because I mean, I'm my role. My role is to help the the party forward. Um, but but really, my my role is is to help the party with the day to day things that need helping. Um, and and the the leader of the party, as well as the EDAs, will will form you know the the policy forward and the 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 not the policy the platform framework going forward um you just mentioned something that i i can't let slip by because you talked about a potential leadership race are we potentially going into one in 2022 or even end of 2021 in december um i think i think it, it, the it's it's clear that that we need to do that um it, jay hill has uh, graciously come on as the interim leader but he's always kept that word interim in front of his name um, um, and, um, I'm hoping we, yes, the answer is we're going into a leadership race for sure. Um, when is the, that's going to be, you know, we need to organize the rules of the race. Um, and when that, when those rules are organized at committee, um, then the details will be announced, but, um, that's going to be happening, uh, in 2022. Um, and so, you know, by the time this time next year comes around, there's going to be a new face that is the leader of the party. And um, I'm excited to see who that's going to be and what direction they take us in. Let's go back to the last election here for a second. I want to talk for a second about what you thought went right. Oh, continue. that's the great thing about this. <laughs> Move around if you want. If you don't feel comfortable, go ahead. But what went right for you? You, you talked earlier about how people didn't think that you were rednecks we i think i think we got the, the the party messaging is right the core of of what we wanted to say i think we did a really good job communicating and that's that that the west in my opinion and i honestly believe it has had a terrible deal in confederation from the beginning um what do you mean by that well i mean we don't have the population um to, to care about us. That's what it boils down to. Um, you know, every everybody is in politics for power. Um, and in order to get power, in order for Aaron O'Toole or Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh to win an election, um, they need to get seats. And those seats exist in Ontario and Quebec. We all know this. And um, what happens out here? I mean, for election after election, we all of the seats are blue. <laughs> I mean, not all of them, but enough of them. Um, and that should that should mean something that that should stand for something. And, and what we get as an, a reward is is uh, um, in this case, um, we voted conservative again. And our reward for that was um, a conservative leader that supports the carbon tax that hurts Westerners, that it remains silent on equalization that hurts Westerners, um, that hasn't, in my opinion, done a good enough job uh, fighting legislation that's really, really bad for our economy out here. The tanker ban, the no new pipelines bill, I'll call it that. I mean, you couldn't even pave a road across the provincial border right now. Um, it's, it's. I'd hate to be Lloyd Minster. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's true. And, 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 you know, the, the, what, what we need to do better, and I think what the goal is for the next two years, is um, the campaign um, helped us realize what I think maybe a lot of people already know is that there's a lot of apathy towards politics. Um, and there's a lot of lack of understanding in terms of how, how federal policies affect your ability to put a roof over your head and, and food on the table for your family. Um, so we need to not only advocate for Westerners going forward, and you asked about the election, but this is what we've learned. We need to go forward advocating for the West, being a voice for them, and at the same time educating those people in a fun and entertaining way about, about politics because too many Canadians just don't care. So I watch the nightly news on a regular basis. I try to be informed about what the what's going on in this world to come up with ideas for the show. But during the nightly news during the election, the one thing that the Maverick Party I found, and this could be a narrative issue for from the media, but you want to separate. And that's that, that was the main goal for the Maverick Party. But if you read the website, you actually have on your website the two two paths forward for Western Canada. One is a better deal, fair representation within Canada, or that second nuclear option, which is let's let's hold a plebiscite, let's go to the voters, and let's see if they want to separate from Canada. 
and that's all of Western Canada. But you, we, we never heard about the first topic, the fairer representation. Was that a challenge for the Maverick Party to overcome to say, no, we want just a fair deal at the end of the day for Western Canada. We don't want to be taken advantage of, of for over and over again from both the Liberals and the Conservatives. So, <laughs> you know... It's a million-dollar question. It is a million-dollar question. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, our, 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 if you're right. If you go to the website and you have a close look at it, um, it's, uh, it's not all about independence. It's about a fair deal. It's about a fair deal, which Westerners have been asking for for generations. I mean, I mean, you know, if you have grandparents out West and you talk to them at the dinner table, they're going to be say they were asking for the same thing when, when they were in their thirties and forties and getting involved in politics. And so, you know, th this is not a new concept. And so just look at, let's just look at what other provinces have done to get a fair deal. Right. Um, the, the. Bloc Québécois have been threatening independence in some form for for generations. And, Since and, about like 1867? And, and, and have they achieved independence? No. I would argue they haven't. Have they achieved their goals? Yes, they have. Right? So, no. I mean, you know, well, not even that, but what does independence look like? I mean, Quebec is is arguing that they're a nation within a nation now, and, and effectively they are. It's been declared that way, hasn't it? So they're independent. Are they still flying the Canadian flag? Yes, they are. Do I have any intention of tearing Canada apart? And the answer is no. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, the it's not up to me. It's up to the people that live here. And so if the mandate comes down that that you know independence is the path forward, then that's what Maverick Party will support. But I think. The majority of Westerners just want a fair deal. Um, and so our our goal as a party and our platform is trying to achieve a fair deal. So, you know, and Jay Hill, I, I don't even need to make up a new saying. Jay Hill, I think, was the one that coined the phrase, not necessarily independence, but independence if necessary. And I think that's an argument that goes a long way. But the biggest thing is what does independence look like? Is it a nation within a nation? Is it... Um, just more provincial autonomy where the federal government doesn't have their fingers in every little piece of provincial and municipal jurisdiction. I mean, the federal government under Justin Trudeau is getting involved in municipal politics now, right? Is that really what they should be doing? Or should they be focusing on things that the federal government traditionally focuses on? So um, I think that what we want as Westerners, which is a fair deal, is achievable simply by getting the feds out of our damn business. Um, and if we can do that, guess what? We've won, right? I mean, Maverick can cease to exist at that point. <laughs> it's not going to happen for a while, though. <laughs> I think you and I both can agree to that. I think, uh, like you said, pow politicians go into politics for power. So um, I want to go, I want to jump forward a little bit here because this episode is airing the first day back of Parliament. November 22nd. Okay. So right now it's November 22nd who's, uh, who, who are watching this or who are uh, listening to this. But technically we're, we're recording this in October, yes. last week of October. So just for transparency's sake, for everyone who's listening and watching. The next 18 months or however long until the next uh, election is going to be an uphill battle for you because you don't have that represent representation in Parliament. We talked briefly in our pre-interview about advocacy and what does that look like to be an advocate outside of Parliament. You don't want to be seen as yelling at Ottawa, but you kind of have to in today's age to be heard. What role does the Maverick Party now play in the next, until the next election going forward? What role does it have to play to ensure that people don't forget about you, but also true Western representation stays on the table? So I'm glad you asked that because uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, we, I promised numerous times during during my my little miniature campaign in Calgary, Bindapur, that we would go into this and we would do politics differently, right? And we don't have any MPs in Ottawa. Nobody's arguing that. So we... we we can't legislate for the next two years, but we definitely can advocate. Um, so, but to do that well and and do that 
in a way that's meaningful means means really thinking differently, doing things that other political groups have not done. And so we stop, in my opinion, we the day the election ended, we for the temporarily stopped being a party. We're not a political party right now. We are maverick, an advocacy movement. We're an advocacy group. We're going to speak up for Westerners. Um, um, our, our members have given us the mandate to, to be their voice. And we're going to do that inside Ottawa or outside of Ottawa. And in this case, until the next election, um, we don't have anybody in Ottawa. So we're going to do it from outside. And there's a lot of creative, meaningful ways that we can advocate for Westerners. And I'm excited to make announcements going forward about about some of the fun ideas that we have and the and the meaningful ideas we have to advocate for westerners so can you give us sort of a tidbit of what that is because uh, i know we're recording this in october but this comes out in november what are some of those ways that you are going to be able to advocate for westerners for the next x years or well, x months well first off uh, people are going to start seeing us everywhere um you know we're expect to see um a maverick table at your local trade show wherever you are um you know that that that's meaningful because we need to get our message out in person um to the communities that maybe aren't watching your podcast um and but more so what we learned in the election is that mainstream media generally doesn't want to say too much about us so we need to take the message of advocacy to the public ourselves and that means um, our website is going to start carrying a lot of news that's meaningful for the West. And you're going to start seeing um, Maverick hosting a podcast on a regular basis with meaningful individuals and prominent individuals from the West. And those two things combined, if we can do that in an entertaining way, people will watch it. And then we, we achieve two things. We achieve, yes, advocacy, but also advocacy through education. Um, I hope that anybody listens to this, maybe picked up one or two things they didn't know before today. Um, and generally that's, that's why the podcast crave is what it is. It's because it's a way to, it's almost like, you know, I, I joke about going to YouTube university every couple of weeks. That was the, that was the crave a few years ago. And, and now people, people don't get their news, uh, from cable news anymore. They get their news, uh, from where they want it. And our goal is to be, um, you know the, the the maverick will be synonymous with with the west um those two things will just go together and we're going to work towards that for the next two years the podcast craze has been amazing but i feel like i need to like bleep out that fact <laughs> that you're starting a podcast to compete against my podcast i just well, don't know how to feel about this i need you to leave matt i apologize no well uh, I, we can we're happy to return the favor if you want to come hey i would love to come on the show and talk about that politics and the western uh western politics um let's talk about let's continue talking about the future here for a few minutes here because you have the maverick party is it is traditionally a party as much as you say you cease to be a party you didn't you are still a party you are still moving <laughs> forward what are the big things what's on your radar what are the big issues that you need you you would like to see this government advocate for or start talking about more seriously because you talked about bill 69 the tanker ban you talked about the no pipelines you talked about representation what would you like to like if you could sit down with Justin Trudeau tomorrow? And hopefully, you didn't just roll your eyes. But if you could sit down with Justin Trudeau tomorrow and say, "Man, we need to do this," what would you tell him? Well, look, we need to, we need to. Politics over the last little while has gotten so silly, right? Um, <laughs> legislation is so bad. Um, I, it, it's just it's it's depressing to watch and it's depressing to follow. Um, the, we used to, we used to write legislation or governments, not we, but governments used to write legislation to meet desired outcomes. And I'd like to see that come back. So, you know, when you say there, you, you identify a problem that needs to be solved and then you write legislation that actually solves it. And you brought up the tanker ban. So I, I just want to use that as an example, because this is the type of, of, of absolute garbage that I wish our MPs out West would, would stand up and come out and say. So the argument against the tanker ban is that it's unfair. This is the main argument people make, is that we can't get oil in and out of our ports out west, but uh, we, can, we can bring OPEC oil and African oil and Russian oil into the St. Lawrence River to feed Quebec and Ontario. That, that's partially true, but that's not the argument we should be making. 
the argument we should be making is that the tanker ban was sold to us under an environmental pretext. Um, people did not want an oil spill along the northwestern coast, right? If you don't want to spill or a spill from an oil tanker, which which is really unlikely, but I'm not going to argue it doesn't happen. But if you want to completely avoid that problem, then banning tankers from those waters seems like a, a reasonable solution. So that's how it was sold to Canadians. And I think most Canadians believe that that's what happened. But when you read the re legislation, you realize that tankers aren't banned from those waters. There's American oil tankers sailing those waters every day because we have an international obligation to allow tankers to go between Alaska and the U.S. mainland or down to, to Panama through the canal. There's a volunteer like a, a voluntary um, embargo on, on driving your boat through there. But, but that doesn't mean anything because it's not enforceable. Yeah. So if you sit on the coast, you can watch an oil tanker go by every day. So all we've done is crippled our own Western economy. We've, we've taken the, the locals in Kitimat and, and Terrace, the people who depend on this for their local economy, and we've, we've you know, hit them in the knees with a baseball bat. Just no chance. And so why can't we just go back to writing legislation and being honest about it. Now, this is our stated outcome, and that's no tankers on the West Coast for environmental reasons. Well, fine, then do it. But if you're gonna if you're gonna do a a, a fake job of it, and a and a fake job selling it, um, and all you're gonna do is cripple Western economy and Western energy, and you haven't even accomplished your intended goal, which is to prevent oil traffic through the waters, like why aren't people talking about this? And, and I mean, I could go, there's so many examples of this exact thing happening to Western industry and, and, and Western Canadians. The fact that this election was fiscal issues, financial issues, pocketbook issues were not talked about in this last election. We talked about vaccines. We talked about guns. We talked about things that weren't affecting my pocketbook. And that's Aaron O'Toole. That's Justin Trudeau. That's Jagmeet Singh. It seemed like we didn't want to talk about it. And we didn't talk about the fact that the carbon tax is being raised every year. And we're last time I checked, and it could be higher when this airs, but a buck fifty for gas, for a liter of gas here in the city of Calgary. I've never seen it that high. This is ridiculous that we have policies that people are saying it's for the greater good, it's for the environment, but it's hurting people who are struggling right now, and I don't think Ottawa understands that. I don't think um, I don't think a lot of people understand that. I mean, people see higher prices at the pumps, but they don't realize why those higher prices are there. I mean, we know sure people understand there's a thing called carbon tax, and it's good for the environment, and it's gonna uh, it's gonna reduce emissions in Canada, or so we're told. But but I mean, the actual implications of it, the fact that. Um, you know, households in rural areas that are that are using not necessarily using natural gas to heat their houses. Those, I mean, natural gas is going up in price, but but those poor households that are that are still using an oil furnace or even electricity to heat their house, those prices are going to become astronomical as we reach one hundred and seventy dollars a ton. Um, the groceries that you pay because that food's got to get shipped with with gasoline and diesel. Um, everything. It, it, so you know. One, the, during our campaign, the number one issue was affordability. Um, you know, I remember doing town halls and, and people were going, okay, well, that's, that's great, that's great, that's great, but what about affordability? What's your policy on that? My answer is all of this policy is about affordability <laughs> because, because the unfair deal that the West is getting is causing things to be unaffordable. Um, and Inflation it, has screwed over this country for a few years and the fact that we're hovering at 4.4 percent or potentially higher when this airs scares me yeah and, and i mean i'm not an economist so I, I don't know the calculation but i will tell you that uh stats can tracks that number for us and they and they did rewrite the equation very recently um and they regrouped the basket of stuff to make it seem not as bad as it is but inflation is a serious issue and and it, we're beyond, I think it's been long enough now, above 4% month after month, that, you know, the original argument of, of, oh, this number is not quite right just because of the drop during COVID, we're beyond that now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, inflation is, is, is going to, I'm not an economist, but I suspect it's just going to get worse. <music>
And our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show um i want to talk i want to move uh uh because i, I just looked at the clock and we're at the 30 minute mark because that's what we're, i said about 40 minutes depending on how much you like to talk and we, we i seem to have got distracted but i want to talk about representation because elections canada just came out with their new numbers and surprise surprise alberta is getting three new seats in the 2024 election so if the next election happens after 2024 alberta is electing three more mps for the province of alberta so we're going from 32 to 35 seats or 35 to 38 35 seats sorry yeah 32 I'm trying to do basic math here. 28 seats, a conservative, two for the liberals, two for the NDP is 32. So three new seats. Quebec, on the other hand, is losing a seat. Quebec, as you can imagine, is up in arms about this. Elections Canada is doing this based on population. More people are coming to Western Canada from Ontario, from Quebec, from Newfoundland, from the Atlantic provinces, from BC. Is there hope for Western Canada? When you see numbers like this, when people are saying more people are moving here, so we have to give you more representation, does that give you hope that Western Canada can potentially have proper representation someday? You know, the, the, I, well, I'm really excited about, about that analysis, but the <laughs> three extra seats for Alberta is a great thing. It is. Um, hey, I'm and, happy about it. And, three, I, and one for uh, BC. Yeah. And it's I, awesome. It's, it's amazing. And and I, I I don't know how it will play out with Quebec. I, I I'm, I'm assuming they don't have much of a say in it at the end of the day. Oh, well, they're um, already upset. Well, of course, Blanchet is already well, I, angry. I've read it all, but it's not really my, my you know. That's let's see what happens. There we'll, you go. We'll watch that and see how it plays out. But but uh, does I it mean, give you hope? It, it does, and people are moving out here, and the population is increasing, and so so very very long term, um, there's a lot of hope for more equal representation out here. But I'm afraid the damage is going to get done too fast um, at, at the current rate. Um, you know, I was really excited about um, the idea of Senate reform all those years ago, and it was talked about like it was going to happen. Um, and I, I wish it had happened. Um, a triple E Senate is something that Maverick has always believed in. Um, it's not a new concept. And, um, you know, that the Senate is there to fix the imbalance that a population imbalance creates essentially right so they're there to stand up for the less populated areas of canada that don't get the same representation in the house of commons and we can't complain about our democratic system um, being what it is uh, but i think that the senate the way it's structured doesn't always achieve that goal um, so regional representation is is the next best thing um, parties like Maverick, um, with blocks of MPs that hold the balance of power, I really don't think we're going to see majority governments coming in Canada anytime soon. <laughs> and as long as there's that environment where there's a minority government, there is a space in the house for regional parties for all kinds of balance of power equations and, and, and who knows. I mean, the, the thing about it is you never know until the group is elected and you can start doing math on the number of seats. But a block of MPs from the West, that's what gives me hope. Um, I think in the short term, that's the solution. In the long term, I don't know. I, I mean, we'll see. I want to I wanna ask you one last question before we wrap up here. And it is a question that you probably heard over and over and over again during the uh, federal election. A vote for the Mavericks is a vote for Justin Trudeau. You are splitting the vote and you're potentially seeing uh, a liberal elected in your seat. Um how do you quash that idea? Because 
I heard from people who wanted to vote for the Maverick Party who said, I, I just can't because Justin Trudeau is going to win again. How do you tell people, you know what, if you truly want a fair deal, because Aaron O'Toole is not going to give it to you, or depending on how his leadership rolls out, because we all see the news and we all can see the writing on the wall, <laughs> whoever the next leader of the Conservative Party is, how do you get people to say, you know what, I need to vote for true representation? It's 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 a it's a really tough thing to get over um i coined the term or i started using the term during the last election um cpc induced political stockholm syndrome and and i mean there's a lot to unpack in that in that term but but the truth i love it, it is... though <laughs> <laughs> I, i'll be up front i know aaron o'toole i'm not a fan of aaron o'toole anybody who's listened to the show knows how much i hate aaron o'toole but continue on but but the truth of it is is, is people are really scared <laughs> to do things differently right um and and the the vote splitting argument was was the conservative attack ad against the maverick um they they propagated that myth um and they and they continue to propagate that myth and it, the truth is just it's just complete garbage it really is and and so um i need to do a better job and the, and maverick needs to do a better job of of showing people that it's complete garbage but the last election is is you know it's all the proof you need I mean, we, CBC called a liberal government before the ballot boxes were even opened in Alberta to count. Because I was texting with people at the polling stations. Um, They hadn't even opened their boxes yet to count, right? It does not matter. A vote, uh, whether, whether Trudeau wins the next election or whether Aaron O'Toole wins the next election, that is decided before Western provinces vote. When people start to really, really understand that, then this this vote splitting nonsense can be put to bed. Um, but, but that's just the truth. It, it really is. Um, getting Trudeau out of government has to happen in Ontario and Quebec. That is not, not our, it's the same argument I've been making. We don't have enough population. It's not, it's not, it's not that it's not our job. We don't have the ability to do it as Westerners. So, so knowing that we don't have the ability to form, to, to have any influence over who's in government, what's a better alternative? Would you at least like a block of MPs that represent you? Or do you just want to keep doing what you've been doing and how has that worked? Matt, I have one last question for you and then we'll, oh, we're going to move on. We're going to finish up here. But we have covered a lot in the last half hour. Sure. Uh, almost 40 minutes, actually. We have covered a lot. Um, for those people who have liked what they've heard, who want to join the party, who want to sort of bring true representation to the West, how can they do that? Of course, um, maverickparty.ca. That's your that's your place for everything. Um, you go to the website. Um, you can get a membership there. Um, you can set up recurring donations. Um, and and you can volunteer. And either one of those things are good. And beyond that, if you go to the how, how can you support us page, you'll notice that the top block there is just share messaging. You know, times are tough. Um, there's there's a, a funny reality. And I'll, I'm sorry to sidetrack it. I know you want to bring this to an No, end, no. Hey, is, you want to talk? I love talking. So let's do it. <laughs> there, there's, there's a real reality. And that is um, that first off, times are tough. And if you're worried about um, what you're going to be doing for a living next month, the last thing you have the energy to do is to, to open your wallet and donate. And I understand that. Um, and what adds to that is is time is valuable as well because because we're all out there working. And not everybody can has the time or the energy or the financial means to advocate for, for what you need in the West. And so that's why we're here. We're here to be your voice in the West because you're too busy to do it. And I understand that, right? Not everybody can. But we can't do what we do without without your support, um, whoever's listening. Um, so for those that, that are able to provide any support and like what they hear, um, every little bit counts and no donation is too small. And we appreciate every last membership that we get. So go to the website, um, check it out do some reading and if you like what you see i think it'll resonate with you we'd, we'd be happy to uh to have you on board 
Now, there's, I guarantee you one person yelling at their car radio right now, driving down the Deerfoot or driving on Highway 2, saying, why didn't you ask Matt this question? Why didn't you ask this question about the Maverick Party? So how can people reach out? How can people, if they like what they hear, but they need a little bit more information from you, how can they reach out to you? Of course, well, go, go to the website and see what's there. Um, there's a lot of information on our website. You can see all of the, all of the policy and all the documents and everything we're doing. Um, all of our press releases are there. Um, the blog is there. So there's, there's tons of information there. But if you need more, you can reach me at matt at maverickparty.ca. Um, you can also go to the contact us form on the website and send a message and that'll go to, uh, well, I'll see it uh, as well as a, a few other people as well. So, um, we'll definitely get back to you if you message us there. Um, you can also reach out to us on all of the social media channels and, uh, and, um, you know, that's, well, actually, I guess that's it. That's all. <laughs> that's it. Um, for those who have listened to the show before, you know, my next view is going to go a little long winded, but please bear with us. Um, Matt's information email address is in the show notes, the website to the Maverick party, plus also all the sh- social medias, Facebook, Twitter. I'm just literally looking at their website as we speak right now, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn are in the show notes, so please check them out because honestly, if you do not get involved, do not complain because you need to have your voice heard and there are enough parties out there right now who have your best interest at heart and the Maverick Party is one that you should be looking at if you believe in Western representation. Matt, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, This has been a fun 40 minutes. It's been really good. Thanks for having me. Uh, Everyone will be back tomorrow morning for another great episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, but also as this is the first day back, Tune in later on tonight for the speech from the throne, which we'll be carrying live and we will be doing analysis after it is read. So stay with us and chat to you guys tomorrow morning. Bye.